All righty. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you this beautiful day. All you people who like to get up really early in the morning. Yeah, better to see me, he said. I agree. Today's going to be a good service. Got a good message in store for you. And so uh, would you please stand with me uh, this morning? We're going, to, we're going to recite the Nicene Creed. If the technological crew got it, then they can put it. But if they don't, then uh, if you know it, you can recite it or you can listen to me as I read it. This is some of the beliefs that we hold firm to, that we hold on really tight to because, because it's a foundation. There's so much false teaching and different things coming into the church that we need to be wary of that. And so what are some of the things that we'll fight for? This is it. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As you're sitting down there, some of you who this may be new, when it says the Holy Catholic Church, no, we're not a Catholic church. Um, but the Catholic, the word Catholic comes from the Greek word katholikos, which means universal, the one body, the body of Christ in the world. And so uh, I could have said that. Somebody asked me, why didn't you just leave it as I believe in the universal church? Um, I don't know, because I think it's cool just to go with some ancient stuff, right? I don't know, just what it is. But we do believe in the one unified body of Christ in the world and its ministry on earth. And we believe that God has called each of us to be a part of a, a local fellowship as a member in the body of Christ. And so uh, it's good to see you guys this morning. Good to see every one of you. I'm kind of shocked. I will say this first service is usually one of the smaller ones, right? Because you have the second and the third coming. But uh, man, you guys like to get up early this morning. Is there something going on? Is there a game coming up? What's the deal? You just like to get up early. This morning, I got up. Let me tell you, I had such a good day. I got up and I exercised before coming to the church. And yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. It's been a while. And I'm kind of getting back in the exercise thing, trying to get things back in order and some disciplines as we go into the summer. I don't want to go into the summer. Right? That happened to me summer before last. Didn't go into it with a plan. And then it was just a wreck all summer long. Last summer, went into it with a plan, physically, emotionally, spiritually, right? Prayer time, study time, very disciplined, all summer until vacation, and I had a blast. And so this summer, I'm not going to waste it. I'm already getting things in order, and we're going to make sure that we get through the summer tired. I don't want to get through and look back and say, man, I wish I'd have done something this summer. I wish I would have done something to improve or deepen my relationship with God. I want to get done with it and be tired. So I've got some ideas I'm thinking, and uh, I'm sure the staff are they're probably like, oh, Lord, help us, because I've shared a little bit of my idea with them. And, uh, and yeah, it would, we would definitely be tired by the end of it. But we'll see where we go. Don't want to spill the beans too much, because it's going to be good if it works out. Today we're going to be in the second part of our freedom series. And today we're going to be talking about freedom from spiritual bondage. God gives us freedom. And I know... Sometimes as you, as you attend church, as you fellowship with the body of Christ, you ask questions saying, well, why? What is the deal? What is this about? What am I supposed to be doing? I mean, is this it? I pray and ask Jesus to be boss and Lord of my life. I surrender myself to him and say, okay, fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. And he does, and he saves me and gets me ready for heaven. And then I attend church on Sundays. And is that it? Is that the way it's going to be forever? Is this going to be my role as a Christian for the rest of my life? Is, is just to show up on Sunday for a couple hours and, and maybe teach a class or help out with the kids or, or greet people in the parking lot? I mean, is that the extent of my, my walk with Christ? More to this. And I'm happy to tell you this morning, yes, there is. Yes, there is. There's a fire that God promises to put us into to refine us, to, to get the impurities out, and to bring out the qualities, the godly 
in investment he makes in us to, to bring that out as something of worth and value. And so it sounds all cute and fun, right? Until you're in the furnace. Until you're being roasted and wondering, hey, wait a minute, this is uncomfortable. I mean, this crucible or this, this, this melting pot is not easy for me to go into and it's not easy for me to stay in. And we sometimes find that there's a huge struggle that takes place. Now, how far are you willing to go with God? Oh, I love Jesus, but how far are you willing to go in your walk with Him? How much are you willing to be refined by the fire? I'm telling you, man, don't fall into the trap of just sitting and soaking. The people who wind up struggling the most and being the biggest struggle that the church will have are people who get in the routine of just sitting, 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 taking, taking, taking. The longer you sit and take and you stay in that routine, the more stubborn and stuck you get and less effective in making a difference for the kingdom of God. People, when they first accept Jesus, when they first realize his salvation, they're so amazing because they just catch on fire and they want to do anything for God. They're so anxious and ready to go. They're ready to make a difference. What can I do to help? How can I make a difference? There's a good thing to that. And that is that energetic zeal, that excitement to be a part of making it happen for the kingdom of God. And sometimes I think for those of us who have been in the church for a long time, we need to get a little taste of some of that excited zeal again. We need to get a, a taste of some of that excited zeal that will get us up off our seat to be a part of something, to make an, uh, to make an investment. Or you could say, to make a step or, or a, an act of commitment. See, that's the bad word today. I want to help, I just don't want to commit to something. I don't want to be tied down. And I want to challenge you all. Let some of this stuff fall away and just be willing to go where God would lead you. Today we're going to be talking about freedom. Some of the benefits of being bound to Christ. Right? I have this little saying thing I put here. Being bound to Jesus is where freedom is found. Being bound to Jesus is where freedom is found. Now that word bound, it doesn't sound like a positive. It sounds more of like a negative. If I'm all bound up, I can't get around. If I'm bound, I'm not able to be free. So how does, how does this being bound tie in with freedom? Well, whenever you marry somebody, whenever you, a, a man and a wife, I mean a, a, a husband and wife come together, um, there's this, this being bound together in matrimony. The bond of marriage. Now, if you are married in here, you can appreciate this idea of being bound to one another. Because if you're not bound to one another, then that your spouse, while you're away, is out doing who knows what. If you're not bound together, then your spouse is with who knows who. And if you're married and your partner is with somebody else, that doesn't make you feel very good. That doesn't bring warm, fuzzy thoughts. The Bible talks about the husband whose wife is committing adultery will become murderous. And that there's no amount of money that that guy can pay him. You can't bribe him. You can't pay him off because he's going to kill you. Right? It's in Proverbs. That's what that brings up in you. Whenever somebody breaks that, that bond of marriage, it's not good. So, in that sense, is what I want to bring us into this when it comes about being bound to Christ. Christ. Being bound to Jesus is where freedom is found. And if you and I can catch this and we're willing to walk with him, and, and like he says, take my teaching on you. Take what I say and walk in it, man. I'm gonna, it's going to be the best way for you. You're going to find that it's easier than what the world is going to bring on you. When Jesus says that, he's not joking. So with that idea, let's read Galatians 2.20. 
I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Why do we say with confidence that true freedom is found by being bound to Jesus? Because he loved us first. He's the one who made the move. He's the one who, who made the commitment before we ever thought of him. He's the one who paid the price before we ever even gave him a thought. Think about this. Jesus, he's proven in history. He did walk and teach on the earth. It's proven in history that he was crucified. It's proven in history that he died and was buried. It's proven that he resurrected, that he rose from the dead. Again, I will encourage you. Some of you bought that book, Case for Christ. Case for Christ is written by Lee Strobel who went in to disprove Christ in Christianity and wound up becoming a Christian. And if you know why I'm so confident to say that it's proven in history, even the resurrection. Why can we commit ourselves and trust our future, our eternity in the hands of Jesus? Because he first loved us. So right on that premise, like the idea of marriage, a husband and wife being bound together, let's build on this. So when it comes to spiritual warfare... In your life, in my life, there's a battle raging all the time. All around us, there are spirits at work, and there's, there's a battle raging for your heart and your soul, your mind. There's a battle raging, and the enemy is trying to get inroads so that he can put chains to bind. The enemy is trying to have doors open up into your family, into your life, so he can come in at will and mess things up. Sometimes we go over and over in the same thing, failing over and over and over, wondering why. And it's probably many times because a door has been opened. And the enemy has every right to go through the door he has the keys to. So you say, well, is this, is Jesus saved me so that I could, Jesus saved me so that I can, I can what, go to heaven one of these days and just attend church on Sundays? No, he saved you for much more than that. Much more than that. And he wants you and me to enter into this spiritual battle that's raging. There are spirits. There are dimensions where there are beings at work. And they are not all good. They're not all bad. But you can bet there's a battle raging. And Jesus wants you and me to enter into this conflict. Paul says it's not against flesh and blood that we struggle. It's against spirits. It's against principalities, layers of leadership in different realms. That's where the battle is raging. And for some, that's like a new concept. Really? Really? And he wants us to begin to fight in those realms. Because the enemy has, has strongholds, the enemy, because of permissions given in the past, has doors open. The enemy, because of permissions given in the past, and maybe things that were practiced, is able to infiltrate and cause uh, trouble or confusion. And those doors need to be shut. How do you and I participate in this? How do you and I participate in this spiritual battle, in this spiritual work? Wait a minute, why can't I just pray, Jesus, take care of it, amen, boom, and it's done? I, that's a good question. I ask that same thing. I'll admit I've even prayed the same thing. Lord, this is confusing, and I understand that there are things in the past and these, these doors that were opened, and, and, and Lord, I just pray that it would all be taken care of now in the name of and the battle goes on. The battle goes on. So, in this idea of spiritual warfare, let me read a story. This is from the book Shadow Boxing, The Dy Dynamic 2514 Strategy to Defeat the Darkness Within. It's written by Henry Malone. This is Sue's story out of his book. Having just become a Christian, Sue is dangerously suicidal. She had left her husband and children and tearfully went on to explain her situation. As I listened to her story, it became apparent that Sue was controlled by the spirits of fear and divination. She was distraught and could hardly function mentally. Her lifetime involvement with witchcraft included, among other things, astral travel and, taking with spirit guide, and talking with spirit guides. These spirit guides even offered her business advice. Fear had emotionally paralyzed Sue and caused her to move in and out of reality. Unable to sleep for days, Sue lived with hallucinations and saw demonic spirits and faces. As we talked, I discovered that various forms of divination were commonplace in Sue's family. Family members frequently played with Ouija boards and were regularly involved with seances when Sue was just a child. Her mother took her to fortune tellers. 
This was repeated many times as she grew older. Sue thought that dabbling in divination or witchcraft was normal. A spirit of immorality had a strong presence in her family as well. As a young girl, Sue was molested by people who frequented her home for witchcraft pur purposes. This created great stirrings of lust in her life. During her teenage years, she became sexually promiscuous with every boy she dated, and she began to experiment heavily with drugs and alcohol. After graduating from college, she eventually married a young man with whom she had a long-term sexual relationship. Sadly, Sue was plagued with deeply rooted feelings of inferiority, low self-esteem, and poor self-worth. As I ministered to Sue, God moved mightily to set her free from the dark spirits of divination and fear, as well as numerous other spirits. Deep wounds of rejection were healed. Sue's life was changed that day. A few months later, I discovered that she had reconciled with her husband and children. She no longer suffered from her fear, from fear, and her suicidal thoughts were gone. Demons no longer talked to her anymore. She was regularly attending church with her husband and children. Together, they were growing in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's spiritual realm. What I don't include in this is that her, her battle though she's had a glimpse of the freedom that Christ offers, was still ongoing. It didn't just end that day. But that gives us just a quick taste of some of what we're talking about today. When you say yes to Jesus, and he becomes actively involved in your life and begins to work, he wants to go do some amazing things to not only set others free, but to set you free as you journey with him, as he refines you. Uh, well, I forget it. Amazing Grace, there is a verse in there. I saw it, we were singing this morning in the chapel, and I'm like, wow, that goes with what, I, through every, it's every toil and snare, what is it? Through every toil and snare, I have already come, right? The God's grace is, is leading me through this. What do you think it's talking about? Man, I got that, I was like, whoa, spiritual warfare, spiritual battle, overcome the enemy and the inroads that he's placed in your life. That's what he's talking about there. Man, that's really good. Deuteronomy 121. God had set the Israelites free. They were slaves in Egypt. They had no choice. They had to take whatever was given them, good, bad, or anything else. They were locked in, and the enemy had complete, absolute control over them. There was no escaping it. God said enough, and so he set those people free. He marched them out across the desert to the edge of the promised land. He said, listen, I have secured this land for you. This is your inheritance from me. I in your God, you are my people, and you're going to go in here and occupy this land. This is yours. Deuteronomy 121 says, See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. He commands them, go in and take the land. Now think about this. If God gave you the land... Why did you have to go in and take it? Why did you have to go in and, and, and conquer it? Why did you have to go in and fight the enemy? If Jesus set us free, why do we have to be a part of that process? Think about it. God says, here's the land. Go get it. Okay? Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, that's right. Satan does have power. Of course, we know that's what we're talking about. He has dominion, and he has, he has permissions. And so, God says, now you go get it. I set you free. You guys enter the land. You go fight the enemy. You see, what they're entering was a land where there were three kingdoms. There were 31 different kings. These people were much larger, much stronger, more equipped. They were more capable in their cities. And these people that God was saying, go in and take, they were not near as tough, as established, as practiced in the art of war as the people that God was saying to go get. Now you can understand the intimidation there. You can understand why they'd be like, oh man, I'm nervous. I don't want to go in and have to fight this. This is, this is kind of scary. They became so full of fear they, become, they became so overwhelmed with, with looking at the enemy and how big they were and prepared they were that they said, no, we'll never survive. We'll never make it. And so God let them wander back away from the promised land in that wilderness. He let them walk in circles for 40 years. 40 years they wandered until that whole generation died off. 
listen, listen, for you and me, the Lord has saved you. The Lord has sanctified you. The Lord has, has redeemed you with his blood and made you righteous. If you are in Christ, you are as righteous as Christ. It's hard to say, but it's true. You are fit for heaven. Yes, he's done all of that. But he has now brought you to the edge of the land and said, now you go take it. You go in and you reclaim the land that has been taken. You go back in and you confront some of the, some of the inroads the enemy has to your life. There are ways to open doors for the enemy. Drug abuse, addiction, pornography. These all open the door for the enemy to have permissions to come in and infiltrate your life. Anger, rage, malice, all kinds of different attitudes that we can, we can allow in our lives, that we can open that door up. The imagination, the Bible tells us to take captive our thoughts and imaginations, making them subject to Christ. Your imaginations can open up doors for the enemy to come in and exploit and take advantage. And some of us have come from years of allowing this kind of stuff to go on. And the Lord saves us, fills us with his Holy Spirit. We have the weapons of warfare that he says, right? The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, our feet shot of the preparation of the gospel, the belt of truth, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit. What do you think all that's for? Sitting in the pew on Sunday? All geared up? No, there's a real battle taking place, and the Lord has given you what you need, and he wants you to go in and do battle. That is a huge part of what this walk with Christ is all about. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you, you're kind of catching this. What are these hang It seems like I just fall back to the same thing over and over again. As soon as God starts doing amazing things in my life, it's almost like there's a chain around my neck. The enemy lets me run, 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 until it finally pulls it and, it, and it's, ah, and it stops everything. As soon as the light of the Holy Spirit gets near, things just seem to crumble and fall apart. Listen, it might just be that you need to be aware of what these, what these strongholds are, and you begin, to, you begin to take the offensive. Okay, let me go here, because i got to get moving. Determine to possess your land and fight the darkness. You'll spend the rest of your life walking in circles. You and I, in your walk with Jesus, you need to determine to possess your land and fight the darkness, or you're going to spend the rest of your life walking in circles. The land that I'm talking about, that we as Christians need to learn to possess, is located in the three different areas of our own lives. I mean, this is personal today, talking about the body, the soul, and the spirit. Those are the three components that we're made of. Areas. That's what Jesus is saying. Now you've got it, now go get it. I've given you what you need. It's time to go and take this back. Body, soul, spirit. There are health effects. The yes, it may be genetic, but it could also be a spiritual attack. And the enemy has an inroad to your health and is affecting you. It could be emotional inroads that the enemy has exploited that does not allow you to have a close relationship. You can only get so close, and then it's almost like there's this impenetrable wall that you can't get through. Have you ever thought that maybe you're not just crazy? That the, it could be the enemy who is bringing confusion into your life, who is clouding up the truth and only lets you go so far and begins to stir it and then you're lost? Spiritual inroads. He can affect you and he can keep you down. He can keep you pulled back from being everything that God has designed you to be. But Lord, I want you to do it. I want you to take control here. I've told you to do it. Come on, God. And you know what he's done? He says, I brought you to the edge of the promised land. Now you go do it. How do you know that's true for us? Well, think about, and I, I can't go into this. I wanted to this morning, and I was telling the guys about it. But I, think about the tomb. Lazarus has been buried for four days. He's dead, and he's stinking. And Jesus gets up there, and here comes the miracle. Here comes the miracle. He's going to call Lazarus out of that tomb, to life. And what does he say? Go roll the stone out of the way. Couldn't God have just rolled the stone out of the way? <laughs> Lazarus, come forth. 
But he does, and he says, you guys go roll the stone out of the way. But it sti- it's going to stink. Jesus, it's going to stink. Go roll the stone. And so they have to go, and they have to push this thing out of the way. And there might have been a little wave of, whew, I told him it was going to stink. But Jesus, and the, kind of the point of that where I would have gone is, is he wants to take the things of our life that stink and are dead, and he wants to bring life where there's death. But we got to roll that stone away so that the light can get on it. We need to be willing to roll this stuff away. See, he involves us. He involves people to accomplish his work. And he wants you to be involved in your progress of being refined for the kingdom. He wants you to identify these spiritual strongholds and what they are. And I'm just giving you guys just a little skim of what, what can, we could go into when it comes to this spiritual stuff. Now, real fast, let's get back to this. Joshua. Joshua is the new leader. Moses dies. Joshua is the new leader. That whole generation that could have gone and taken the land, they died off, and now there's a whole new group. And all this group, they're a lot different than the last one because they're gung-ho. They're fearless. They're like, let's go get it. God says, go, let's go. God, he, he makes a miracle, the river. I mean, this is the river's at flood stage. And, and normally, nations, when they would go to war, you'd have to get your act together before flood stage. You'd have to get all of your, your equipment across these rivers and stuff before flood stage. No doubt the enemy is thinking it's flood stage. They might be coming, but they won't be coming anytime soon. And God says, no, we're coming now. These guys march down with the Ark of the Covenant, and the water just stops. Somewhere upstream it stops, and man, the water just go, And they walk across this entire nation. They walk across the river during flood stage on dry land. Now, they're gung-ho now. They're like, man, let's go get them. I can see that. That would, that would embolden me if that were to happen. I'd be like, okay, God, you said go, let's go. I don't know what your dry stream experience is, but I know that God wants to give us one. I don't know what your experience where you encountered God in such a real way that you know that you know that you know. If you haven't had that, you need to pray for it because that's what these folks got. And they walked in that promised land knowing that God of heaven was pleased with them, that he was wanting them to go in and fight these battles. And they marched across. In Joshua chapter 1, starting verse 1 there, After the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over to this Jordan, and you and all this people into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. And over and over, if you continue to read there, you'll see where he tells Joshua, don't be afraid. I got this. Don't be afraid. I got this. And the same message is for you and me today. Listen, the battles are going to be tough. The enemy is going to be intimidating. But go across and fight for what it is that I've given you. Reclaim the land that's mine. Right? We know the earth belongs to God. Everything belongs to him. But the enemy had come in and set up camp. In the same way in our lives, there are areas that we've allowed the enemy, we've given him permissions. And he's set up camp where we let him. But you know what? Now, if you're in Christ, you belong to Jesus. You don't belong to you anymore. You belong to him. And he's saying, come on, man, let's do this. You can fight these battles. You can win. Wherever you put your foot, I'm going to take it back. You and I just need to be willing to take steps and walk where the Spirit of God leads us. Some of those places that you have pushed down and buried away and and hidden, you don't want to revisit that. Maybe abuse. You know, it's amazing how many people have been sexually abused. That's one of the ways the enemy can open the door and have access into a person's life. A child, you didn't ask for it, you weren't looking for it, but it happened. That's one of the ways the enemy can have an open door and access into your life. And that's the kind of stuff that needs to be confronted and dealt with. I don't want to bring that back up because that, when I bring that up and we open that door and go in that room, it hurts. And you know what Jesus is saying? Wherever you put your foot, we're going to take this. We're going to do this together. Jesus says, I'm with you always. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You're not alone in these struggles, in these battles. It may be painful, it may be scary, it may be difficult, but he's with you, and 
He'll walk with you into it. The Lord wants to do this. Don't stay out there wandering in circles. Get to it. Get to task. When we accept Christ, we too must face kings and kingdoms that have become entrenched in our minds and souls. And again, 31 kings, three different kingdoms. These people had to go in and they had to fight a real uh, established and equipped enemy. This was not easy. This was going to be difficult. But listen, what else are we going to do? Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Listen, he commands us to go. He commands us to be disciples. A disciple is a student, but more than a student. A disciple, you want to become everything that the master is. And as a disciple of Christ, you and I, we, if we're going to truly become everything that that Jesus was and is, then we have to be willing to go to these places of battle. We have to be willing to go to these places of confrontation. We have to be willing to face the pain and the difficulty so we can get through this and we can get on to the next battle to the next struggle. Listen, it doesn't end. It doesn't end. For those who think, I don't have to worry about that because that doesn't even pertain to me. There might be a problem. Pride comes right before fall. The one minister who boasted, I'll tell you what, I might do some stupid things, but I will never commit adultery, found himself losing his ministry after having committed adultery. You think you got it? Well, pastor, are you just trying to make us insecure? Yeah, kind of. We need a Savior. We need Jesus. And we need Him more sometimes than we think we do. This study, for me, I've had a lot of time to go through this. And I'm calling out to God saying, God, I need you. I'm not near as good as I thought I was. Lord, there are areas of weakness that I too am affected by. Lord, I need you. If I've ever needed a Savior, it's now. Because I'm just, I don't know, I want to succeed. I want to be all that God created me to be. But it's going to only happen if I become more dependent on Him. And I find the areas of my life where I need to rely on Jesus more than ever before. And as I submit to his authority, as I turn myself over to him, and I walk in obedience, and I walk in faithfulness, right? The Lord's going to continue working on me no matter how painful it is. But it's true for all of us. Somewhere, some way, you're affected by this. It's not over until we stand in his presence, until we're done, until you take your last breath, right? The Bible says it's born a man to die once and then the judgment. This is going to be a battle until the day you die. Nobody's exempt from it. So I say, let's be willing to do it. Let's face these kings. Let's face these kingdoms. Let's go after it. Let's go to the places where there's hurt. Let's go in and just see if Jesus doesn't keep his word and take care of us like he said. And you know with confidence I can say, he will. Third thing is the willingness to compromise with the enemy is one of the major causes of failure in the life of a believer. Willingness to compromise. Don't compromise. You know where you find that happy place. Where, you know, okay, I can get by and I can be content and I can be successful as long as I don't go here. The enemy, he doesn't care how much you pray, how much you fast, how much you serve in your church. He doesn't care about any of that stuff. He'll let you go crazy with all that. What he's desperately afraid of is for the believer who opens up their life to Christ and says, Lord, I want to go from glory to glory. I don't want to compromise and settle where I'm comfortable. I'm ready to go and be everything you designed me to be. And Lord, if there are strongholds the enemy has in my life, let's break them down so that you can take more control of my life. And the more control he has of your life, the more effective you are for the kingdom, the more dangerous you are against the kingdom of darkness. And the enemy would love for you to compromise and just say, well, I'm happy here. And you can. 
But the problem with that is, is these strongholds, this place the enemy occupies, it's not going to stay the same. It's not going to hold. It's going to grow more powerful. It's going to grow stronger and deeper control on you, right? The imagination thing I was talking about, Jesus says, look, you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery, right? Physically commit adultery. But I tell you, now he's like a raise the bar. I tell you, if you even look at a woman and you lust for her, you've committed adultery in your heart. It's like guilty, right? Your imagination, your imagination is a place, your thoughts, where you spend your, your time meditating. That is a place where the enemy can put absolute strongholds. And so, I'm just going to be comfortable here. Using that as an example, the enemy can begin to build up, can begin to establish more and more, and have more control. Listen, don't compromise. Because it's just going to hurt you later on. Confront whatever it is. Whatever the addiction, whatever the struggle. Be willing to say, let's do battle. It may be tough. This may be hard. But you know what? Let's do battle. And I know the Lord is with me. So I'm going to take this on. I'm not going to compromise. People need you. Being bound to Jesus is where freedom is found. No doubt there's truth in that. But your family needs you to fight these battles. Your children's mom, dad, your children need you to begin closing some of these doors. Because listen, then you get into this idea of the generational curses. The things that have been opened up that are passed down. The church, the body of Christ today needs some people who are willing to go there. Have the tough conversations, fight the tough battles, to close the doors, to break the chains, to release the hold of the enemy so it doesn't pass on to the next generation. It's true. It's there. Luke 4, 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came to do more than just save you and prepare you for heaven, right? To get you right for heaven. He's done more than just prepare a place for you to sit and hang out and be a part of the church. He has saved you. He has purchased you so that you can do battle with the enemy. And you and I, in our lives, we need to be willing to do battle. 1 John 4, one more. I'm going to give you a glimpse into the spiritual. We say Sue's story sounded a little freaky, right? That's a little bit too much for me when it comes to all this stuff with these spirits and all. But listen to me. Let's let the Bible... Right? We may not trust Sue's story, but do we trust the Bible? So let's see what the Bible says. 1 John 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now at work in the world. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. This is all about spiritual conversation. There are spirits that are transferring information. It's happening. And we're told to test the spirits. Does that mean that believers can be, can be entertained by a false, deceiving spirit? Yes, it does. That's why we're to test the spirits. That's why we're to put those to the test. Just because it's spiritual doesn't mean that it's good. It doesn't mean that you have to open up and here I am. There's a spiritual battle raging. There are spirits that are communicating. And we need to be very careful about this. And we need to do battle in this realm. Yeah? So I say, being bound to Jesus where freedom is found, being bound to Jesus where freedom is found, if you, my friend, have not submitted your life to Jesus and made him boss and Lord, then it doesn't matter. You are open to anything and everything that wants to come down and, and entertain you. Do you know Jesus? Have you surrendered to him saying, Lord, here I am, be boss of my life? That's where it starts. How do you do this? Well, you become a disciple. The Bible says go make disciples. My job is to make disciples. 
If you have those blue cards in front of you in the chairs, take, fill it out. Put the information on there, what you want to do. And then tonight at 6, for, for example, we're doing our Growth Track 301. Come, be a part of a group of people who are learning how to be disciples of Jesus. Come, be a part of that process of not just growing in fellowship with the Lord, but with other people who are on the same journey that you want to be on or that you are on. Be a disciple. Commit. Yes, it's going to cost you something. So be it. It's worth it. I want to go there in my own life. And I encourage you, be willing to go there as well. Let's go to those places of hurt and pain. And let's let the Lord bring the victory. Right? Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I pray for your people right now. Lord, there is a spiritual battle raging. And the enemy has a plan, has a design, has a desired result for every person here. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help, help each of us to see that we need to be bound to you so that we can experience true freedom. And as we commit ourselves to you, Lord, you want us to be a part of that process of taking back what the enemy once controlled. And I pray for your people this morning that you begin to show them the places they need to put their feet, the first battles that they need to encounter. And Lord, as they go about this, I pray that you would help them to, to feel your reality, to feel your presence, to know that you're there with them. And Lord, that as a result of this, this willingness to go there, that we would have great stories, great results, testimonies of the work that you are doing. Bless them, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. No, ma'am, not right now. Folks, I want you to have...